Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for our first session in a four-part series on genetic testing. Uh, I am Troy Jorgensen. I'm the program coordinator here for Project Echo Nevada. You can reach out to me. Um, I believe I've, I've contacted most of you here. Um, but if you have any questions, issue, technical issues, anything like that, um, I'm the guy to reach out to. So uh, I want to introduce Dr. Nathan Slotnick, who's going to be speaking for us today. Go ahead. Um, my name is Nathan Slotnick. Uh, this is my first experience with Project Echo, but it's a fascinating ability to communicate with uh, uh, the Western states and to make new friends. So I'm looking forward to this as being the first step in a uh, long series of discussions that we can have. Great. And we'll go around the group here so we can uh, hear who you are, where you're from, um, and what interests you about this topic today. So we'll start up in the upper left corner. It's uh, just a screen name of US. 020551. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Stefan Mokerheisky. I'm a pediatrician in Denver. I'm part of the Colorado State Team Mountain Stage Genetics Network. Wonderful. Good. Great to have you this morning. Uh, next is Alan. You want to go ahead? Yes, I'm Alan Fisk. I'm in the ELCO office for the School of Medicine. I do technical support. If you're having technical issues with your your uh, 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 audio video, why please give a let Troy or myself know, and if we can help, we will surely will. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Next is uh, I Goldstein. Um, if you could unmute yourself, we'd be able to hear you, and you could introduce yourself. Go ahead. We should be able to hear you if you have a microphone. Okay, maybe no audio there. So if you want to write in, uh, we can see you, but I can't hear you, no problem. Uh, so next we'll go to Bart Anderson. Hi, Bart Anderson, uh, physician assistant down in Caliente, Nevada. Wonderful, great to have you today, Bart. Uh, Jacqueline Loya. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, uh, Health Systems Manager at American Cancer Society in Riverside, California. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, Linda, Linda Mo is next. Linda, are you there? Okay, if you could just write in through the chat. Uh, Christy Wees. Christy, go ahead. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Christy Wees. I'm the Consumer Engagement Director and Social Media Coordinator for Mountain States Regional Genetics Network, of which uh, Nevada is part of. Thanks, Christy. Good to have you. Excellent. Um, Annette Laura. Um, my name is Annette, and I am the Project Manager for Mountain States Regional Genetics Network. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Tia Ruddy. Hi, um, yeah, I'm a nurse and I'm on a contract with Nevada Cancer Coalition. Um, my actual interest is that we've just discovered a lot of breast cancer in my family and um, I'm very interested in we're having a family reunion coming up, very interested in taking the information to that so that we can all um, be on a, a good page regarding our genetic testing. Good. Great, thanks, Tia. Um, I'm gonna jump back to M. Kennedy. You joined us by phone, it looks like, so that's star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, we can hear you. M. Kennedy, are you there? Could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Melissa Kennedy. I work out here at the Nevada Health Center as a patient navigator. Wonderful, great to have you, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, then M. Rindler. I don't know if you can hear me very well, um, but I, I'm with the Utah Newborns. Oh, you just cut off there. Utah Newborn. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Um, e. Novak. Uh, yes, if you can hear me, I'm uh, Elizabeth Novak, 
and I'm from Emporia, Kansas, and I'm a cancer registrar. Excellent. Great, thank you. Uh, Linda, I think, Linda, you wrote in. Um, Linda Beischel, uh, NBS and Genetics Co Coordinator in Montana, wonderful. Uh, Linda wrote in, the other Linda, uh, Linda Morgan, In-Person and Telehealth Genetic Clinic uh, RN, wonderful. Uh, Mark Croshaw, Go ahead, Mark, we should be able to hear you. Okay, maybe no, no microphone there. Um, Ann Loveless. Um, it looks like you're joined by phone, so star six to unmute yourself. Go Hello ahead. there. Hi, um, it's Ann Lovelace. I'm manager of research finance. Uh, regulatory and data in the research department at Comprehensive Cancer Centers of Nevada in Las Vegas. So this is a very interesting topic, topic for us, especially in research. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and Ann Miles from Kingston, do we have a microphone for you today, Ann? Uh, maybe no microphone for Ann today. Uh, then we have a number, it's just 24636. Hi, that's me, I'm Jess Shorter at Renown Health. I'm our breast health coordinator. Wonderful, good to have you. Um, number of other folks joining us, A Flores, 012. Hi, my name is Anil Flores, head of Las Vegas, Nevada with Dignity Health. For our and I'm a breast cancer navigator. Wonderful, thanks for joining us. Um, Mark Croshaw wrote in uh, from Caliente, Nevada, work with the rural clinic and hospital there. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, and then our last is uh, Dr. Robin Palmer. Could you introduce yourself? Dr. Palmer, are you there? Okay, maybe no microphone for Dr. Palmer. So again, just welcome everybody to our first session in this uh, genetics testing ECHO series. We're gonna do uh, three more parts after this one today. Uh, so great to have you joining us. Throughout this presentation, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself with the icon in the lower left corner of the window or star six if you're joined by phone to ask questions or write in uh, via the chat box as well. And I'll send a message out through that right now so everybody can see where it is. Um, so feel free to write in questions through that as well. So we'll get going here with the talk. All right. Jump okay. away. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started. My, my, my name is Nathan Slotnick. I am a medical geneticist in practice in Reno, where I've been for the last 15 years. My practice and my education has been multidimensional. And one of the things we're going to touch on during our talk today is how genetics has um, affected our approach and our thoughts in terms of general medical health. Um, when I was asked by Project ECHO and by the Nevada Cancer Coalition to um, begin the series, it was with the idea that uh, we could talk about where new technologies are taking us and how our abilities um, to provide accurate diagnoses and management planning are affected by these new technologies. But it became, a, I became convinced from the very beginning that that kind of conversation would be very much dependent on our ability to build a really strong and uh, resilient foundation on which this uh, structure of medical genetics and technology would need to be built. With that in mind, I elected to begin the whole concept of uh, this discussion with a very seemingly basic uh, discussion of Mendelian genetics, history of genetics, uh, go into some newer topics which reflect both the new technologies and the way we think about uh, non-Mendelian genetics, and then take a step into some of our newer technologies and to try to touch on both the um, both of the uh, risks and benefits, I guess, 
of these technologies in, uh, in clinical practice. My background is clinical medicine. Uh, although I am a geneticist, uh, primarily, my training has reflected obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, as one gets older, the idea of getting up in the middle of the night to deliver babies becomes much less appealing. So I have uh, decreased, not completely eliminated, but decreased my high-risk obstetric practice. And right now I'm seeing a great deal of referral uh, interest and volume in my office here in Reno. Patients that I'm seeing right now reflect a broad uh, range of genetic diagnoses, but the primary focus that I'm uh, attending to right now is cancer genetics. Um, one point I'd like to make parenthetically is that the discussion we'll be having today, even though it will be focused on genetics as a general topic, uh, cancer always has, is uh, of great interest. And if there are any questions about anything we uh, touch on today, Please just speak up and we can uh, get started in that regard. So when we talk about these topics, what we talk about is perspectives and the way we look at things. Clinicians view their patients through the lens of their own training and their own proclivities. Um, when, you look, when you talk about cancer, and I'll use cancer as an ex example here because it is so it's a large a part of what I'm doing now, when you look at cancer, it depends on how you look at it. The surgical oncologist will look at cancer in one way. The radiation oncologist will look at cancer in a slightly different way. A medical oncologist may look at cancer in another way. But the way the, um, the clinical team looks at genetics with respect to cancer is interesting. As you can see here, if we think of cancer as this big entity here, we look at genetics from the perspective of an oncologist as being a relatively small part of what it is they do in, in general. And it does make a lot of sense that from an oncologist perspective, genetics is a relatively small but important part of what it is that they're doing and how they treat their patients. Um, there's a different perspective that I have. My perspective is, uh, is exemplified here. I look at cancer as a relatively small part of genetics. Genetics touches pediatrics, obstetrics, cardiovascular disease, adult health, and cancer is a part of genetics. So as I'm trying to demonstrate here, what we're talking about is how perspectives can really uh, influence our approach to patients and what it is that we are trying to accomplish with them. I'd like to begin with a case. This is an actual case that I was involved in a few years ago. And it really is an example, I think, of where our technologies are, where they're headed, and how you, utilizing the technologies can really have beneficial uh, effects on both individual patients and families. This particular patient is a 52-year-old with a recent diagnosis of advanced stage breast cancer, it was invasive ductal carcinoma. The cancer was a triple negative form, and that's not good. After surgery, her therapeutic options appeared to be somewhat limited. Now, this case took place in Ohio, and I'll explain how I got involved in a bit. In, effort, in an effort to determine the most reasonable management plan, a sample of archived cancer, breast cancer tissue, was sent for an analysis to a laboratory in Boston. At the laboratory, what they did was to have uh, 315 different cancer-related genes and 28 cancer-related DNA rearrangements that were examined. And what they found when they did tumor genotyping, that there was a pathologic variant identified in a BRCA2 gene. Now remember, BRCA genes are uh, very intimately related to the development risks for breast, ovary, and other forms of cancer. Now, when the results came back, the oncology team in Ohio were unsure of what the familial or germline implications of that test result were. And they asked uh, the laboratory in Boston what it meant. I'm a consultant with that particular laboratory, and so I was called in to get in touch with the team in Ohio 
to put together some uh, 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 approaches. Now, at the time that this particular study was done, there had been 6,663 variants or abnormalities, mutations, if you will, identified in the BRCA2 gene that had been reported in the literature. This particular variant had been reported as being likely pathologic, and that was an important finding. I suggested to the team in Ohio that they do a very careful pedigree analysis and consider germline testing if the pedigree analysis justified it. What was found was that there were three immediate family members who were at risk for cancer development. They started surveillance and an early cancer was found. So what this story suggests is that the newer technologies allow us to identify patients and families who are at potential risk for developing uh, cancers and we're better able then and uh, more um, uh, energized to look uh, earlier and with the goal of trying to identify cancers become the, before they become um, too extensive. Now a little bit of background and I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about myself just to so, show you where I'm coming from. I'm in general uh, trained as a both an academic, academic and a teacher. I worked in medical schools until about a decade ago and teaching and doing research. About 10, 10 to 12 years ago, I began a private practice, uh, which uh, gave me a perspective that I didn't think that I would have about the trials and tribulations of those of us who uh, work outside of the academic environment. Um, I am not a pediatrician. I am not a cancer doctor. I'm not a cardiologist dealing with high blood pressure or uh, hypercholesterolemia. What I am is a geneticist. And as I've suggested, because genetics touches virtually every discipline in medicine, the geneticist's perspective can be useful in providing uh, 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 perspective in uh, treating those patients. Now, I have to admit, and my wife is relatively reluctant for me to say this, but I don't have any disclosures. I don't own stock in any companies. I uh, don't have any specific uh, interest in any specific testing companies at all. Um, a little bit of background to show history, of, I guess, more than anything else. Uh, when I was doing my PhD work back in New York City years and years and years ago, I for some reason was chosen to uh, attend a dinner and uh, introduce the guest speaker who was Dr. James Watson. Uh, Watson and Crick are the uh, sort of the, uh, the early leaders of uh, genetics and it was their work that defined DNA as a hereditary material, both structure and functionally. Uh, so I'm sitting at this table, seven or eight people, state senators, US senators, dean of the medical school, uh, chairman of my department, and here I am sitting there next to my wife, and I'm completely dumbfounded. What am I doing there? We move into the lecture hall, and the lecture hall was one of those very steep lectures, and Dr. Watson was standing in front of the uh, audience before he started, waving at his friends in the audience and saying hi, and my wife jabbed me in the side with her elbow and said, Dr. Watson's fly is down. You have to tell him. So I, it was my, I will be forever known as uh, my relationship with uh, Dr. James Watson, Nobel laureate, probably the smartest person I've ever met, telling him to pull his fly up. So that's my relationship and how it, how it began. Now, the question comes up, why, why are we having this discussion at all? Well, there are a number of different uh, issues and topics we can address, but the big one, as I've indicated here, is that uh, and this is straight out of the AMA, the AMA 2018 publication, although 98% of physicians know that patient genetic information will influence therapy, less than 10% believe that they are adequately informed about the use of genetics or genomic testing information to apply it in practice. I actually believe that 10% is probably 10% too much. For a physician to stay up to date on the new uh, the, the new reflections of uh, technology, to understand what the implications of test results are, to be able to critically analyze results that come out of laboratories, 
it's virtually impossible. It's a full-time job. Uh, for that to, to be accomplished, uh, it is important that we do the best we can to try to educate our colleagues about where things are going and where we are right now. Obviously, the technologies themselves are advancing rapidly, and in a very general sense, they're very poorly understood. The clinical applications of these technologies are profound. We are all affected personally and clinically. There won't be any of us, I believe, in the next five to 10 years, who won't be influenced both professionally and personally by these technologies. As I indicated, all areas of medicine are touched by these technologies. And, and this is a point I'll get to near the end. Um, there is a huge risk of misrepresentation of what the technologies can do and what they can't do. And I'll get into that in just a minute. But the, uh, the watchword here should be, if you, if you smell a rat, there's probably a rat. And we need to think about that and be able to critically analyze these things. So let's begin with a little bit of history. These are pictures of both uh, Gregor Mendel, and this is a very lovely picture of uh, Charles Darwin. These gentlemen, in their brilliance, were able to identify hereditary issues long before hereditary technology existed and before even DNA was known to be the hereditary material. They were able to define things like natural selection, independent uh, assortment of factors in heredity, and certain patterns of inheritance, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And here's a picture of Watson and Crick. Uh, Watson's on the left of this picture right here. And uh, I can't tell from this picture whether his fly is up or down. <laughs> I cannot tell. Now, th this is a picture of a um, student-derived uh, uh, karyotype. Students frequently are, do their own karyotypes when we try to teach them genetics. This actually has a lot of mistakes in it, but that's not the point. The point is that this is what you see if you look at the chromosomes of a human looking at a single cell's chromosomes. Chromosomes are arranged here by size and by banding pattern. There are two number one chromosomes, two number two chromosomes, etc. The DNA that's packaged in these chromosomes if you were to stretch it out to its natural length, you'd find that the length of DNA from a single cell is about two meters long, two meters long, and there are 30 trillion cells in the human body. We estimate that there are anywhere from 25 to 50,000 genes that are coded for by the DNA that, are pack that is packaged in these, uh, in these uh, chromosomes. One, as you can, if you count here, you can see that there are 46 chromosomes total, 23 of these chromosomes will come from our mother and 23 from our father. If the father contributes an X chromosome as one of the 23, will be a female. If the father contributes a Y chromosome, will be a male. But this, uh, this picture itself was something that really was not known and uh, the total number of chromosomes wasn't even uh, fully characterized for humans until the early 1960s. So it's a relatively recent, um, recent finding. Now, if we move one step farther, we want to talk about some basic genetic concepts. As I indicated, the amount of, <clears throat> the amount of DNA in the chromosomes is huge. There are three billion base pairs of DNA in the nuclear chromosomes. And the way that DNA is expressed genetically is that the DNA codes for proteins, um, with certain exceptions, and the expression of the genes that code for those proteins is uh, the way genetics as a, as a discipline is uh, 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 practiced. Now, errors in DNA, that is when mutations occur, those errors can result in abnormally made or, and or poorly functioning proteins, or there could be no phenotype difference that you can see at all if the error is in a non-functional part of the protein. So when you do DNA testing, you have to remember that not every answer that you'll get will be either positive or negative. You can have um, results that will give you no interpretable clinical result. 
Now, obviously, you can have errors or mutations within the gene, or you can have errors in er uh, regions adjacent to the gene, which are involved in the control of how that gene is expressed. Those uh, errors are uh, what we call control side errors, and they can have effect on the way the gene is uh, manifesting its activity. Now, when Mendel first described his uh, uh, work, it was a, uh, a seminal moment in genetics, but much of the things that uh, he uh, described were um, difficult to see how they would apply. Over the years, what we have defined through his original work and many others since is that one gene is related to the production of one particular protein. This is basic Mendelian genetic concepts. The DNA sequence determines an RNA sequence, which itself will determine a protein sequence, and protein function will be what is expressed genetically. Watson and Crick defined the hereditary mechanisms, that is the DNA itself, and that what you're seeing is a, when you look at an individual, is a phenotypic expression or correlation of the genetics of that particular uh, individual. One of the basic Mendelian concepts are that mutations are passed from parent to offspring in an unaltered kind of way. And of course, your ability to identify a mutation will be uh, uh, associated with your ability to look for it and see it. For example, if you have a mutation in a hemoglobin gene, you might not see the expression of that hemoglobin gene mutation in a skin cell. But if you looked at the genetics of that skin cell, you should be able to identify that mutation. That's uh, a term called expressivity. Now, Mendelian genetics leads us in another direction as well. How do these, uh, how do these patterns work? Well, every time a cell divides, there are three billion base pairs of DNA that need to be copied. We assume that the copying mechanism for DNA replication is perfect, and that each daughter cell from a cell division is genetically identical to the other daughter cell. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, that's not necessarily assumption, an assumption that you can make. There are uh, classic Mendelian forms of inheritance as well. Uh, you, if your parent is affected with a dominant gene, uh, achondroplasia is a good example, you have a 50-50 chance of had, having inherited that gene from your parent. There are other forms of inheritance, including recessive inheritance. Examples of that could include Tay-Sachs disease or cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease where two unaffected parents have a one in four chance of having an offspring having inherited two abnormal mutations. Carriers are generally unaffected, but one in, have a one in four risk if two carriers get together and have a child. Genes on the X chromosome can act differently. Uh, X-linked inheritance is an example of that, and there are forms of uh, inherit, X-linked inheritance, which are exemplary of that as well. Hemophilia, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, are examples of X-linked inheritance, where males are uh, affected and females can be carriers with often no manifestation of the condition at all. And then the last concept that we uh, come out of basic Mendelian thinking is that you can have aneuploidy. If you produce an egg with an abnormal number of chromosomes, by mistake, that abnormal number of chromosomes might lead to miscarriage or to uh, aneuploidy, for example, trisomy 21, Down syndrome, or others as well. Here are two karyotypes of two aneuploid state. On the left, we can see if you count, there will be 47 chromosomes, there are three number 21 chromosomes. Uh, this is called trisomy 21, and this is a Down syndrome karyotype. On the, on the right, you can see a karyotype from a situation where there was a double fertilization event into an egg, where 23 chromosomes from the egg are joined by 23 chromosomes from one sperm, 
and 23 from the other. This is a situation called triploidy. It is uniformly fatal, but it has 69 chromosomes. This is another aneuploid state. Now, the five crucial Mendelian concepts uh, that have proven to be not always true, but are predicted by Mendelian uh, thinking are, it shouldn't matter which parent your DNA comes from. That is, whether the gene or gene mutation comes from your mother or your father, it shouldn't really make any difference at all. Secondly, the second uh, concept is that DNA is copied faithfully at each round of mitosis and meiosis. That is that there are no errors that are made. The third concept is that germline DNA, that is the gametic DNA, is reflective of non-germline DNA or somatic DNA. That is, the genetics of a skin cell is the equivalent of your germline DNA. That's not necessarily true. Uh, fourth point, all cells in the body are expected to have identical DNA. That if you look at the DNA sequence from a muscle cell in your arm and compare it to a pancreatic cell, they should be completely identical. That's not true. And the last point is that nuclear or chromosomal DNA is all the genetic material that we have in the cell. And that's clearly uh, false, and I'll show you why in just a minute. So, so the first example that will uh, sort of lead us down a, uh, a concept of maybe Mendelian genetics is not the only way to think about things is some uh, concept called imprinting. Uh, it works out that about 1% of all mammalian genes, it does matter where you inherit this particular gene from. This is a, uh, a, a, a condition which is called epigenetic. Now, in this situation, there's no permanent DNA change uh, in imprinting. It involves, and is a result of, differential methylation or modification of proteins attached to the DNA. It achieves um, what we call a monoallelic expression without changing DNA, and it's reversible. That is, uh, if a imprinted gene comes into your into you from your mother, if you pass it on uh, and you're male, you can alter the imprinted gene as it passes through your germline. Um, it turns out it is accomplished in germline cells. And as I indicated, it affects about 1% of all mammalian genes. And there are many diseases that result from imprinting. Now, the example, the classic example of imprinting is uh, the combination of what we call Prader-Willi syndrome and Engelmann syndrome. Both of these um, conditions, these syndromes, map to the same region on chromosome 15, in, in chromosome 15 between bands 1-1 and 1-3. All of these, both of these conditions are related to a small deletion in the DNA within this region. But if you inherit this, you, this deletion from your father, you'll have increased likelihood of developing Prader-Willi syndrome, which is described as having hypotonia, obesity, mental retardation, and hypogonadism. If, however, you inherit the deletion from your mother, you're more likely to demonstrate signs of Engelmann syndrome. That is epilepsy, tremors, smiling disposition, and what they call the happy puppet syndrome. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. Now, this imprinting results from, as I indicated, differential methylation of certain genes in meiosis, where different genes are methylated and controlled differently in male meiosis versus female meiosis. This is a picture of an individual with Prader Willi syndrome, obesity, mental retardation and hypogonadism. And this is a picture of an individual with Engelmann syndrome. Uh, he moves as if his arms and legs were on strings, and so it's also known as the happy puppet syndrome. These kids are also retarded. But the point to be made here is that the 
inheritance is influenced by which parent passes this specific deletion on. Now, one of the points, this is a little tangential, but it'll, I hope, make some sense, is um, the last two cases of Engelman's and Prader Willi are demonstrations of microdeletion syndromes. Now, we like to think that all of the genes in our genome are there, but there are certain situations where you can have small deletions of certain regions on the chromosome, um, a chromosome, and have specific phenotype manifested. The one that has gotten the most attention recently is called the George syndrome. The George syndrome is tied to a deletion on chromosome 22 um, in the uh, Q arm near band 11. And the clinical manifestations of the George syndrome are related to the size of this micro deletion. Uh, there can be associated cardiac defects, uh, palatal defects, clefting issues, and, uh, and other, uh, other issues as well. All of the rest that you can see here are demonstrations of what we call microdeletion syndromes, and they're listed equally here. This doesn't project very well, but it describes how many different types of microdeletion syndromes there, there could be. So the first point in summary is, not every gene is manifesting uh, the same, depending on whether you inherited from your mother or your father. The second point, and this is an important point too, especially when we think about cancer, is what we call somatic mosaicism. As I mentioned, there are 30 trillion cells in our body, and it's very hard to get our brain around how many cell divisions it takes from a fertilized egg to 30 trillion, but the number is very, very large. As I also indicated, there are three billion base pairs of DNA that, are, that need to be copied at each cell division. Although we like to think that the copying of DNA in cell division is perfect, and that each daughter cell from a cell division is genetically identical to each other, it's wrong. We currently estimate that there are well over hundreds of thousands of errors that occur every time a cell divides in DNA replication alone. Now, this is a little teleologic, but cells don't like their DNA to be altered. So over evolutionary time, cells have evolved a number of different mechanisms to identify and repair the errors that occur and that are intrinsic to cell division. And for the most part, they do a pretty good job. But if you inherit from your family a mutation in one of the genes that prevents the cell from efficiently repairing the DNA errors, mistakes will happen, mistakes will accumulate, and cancers can occur. And for that, for that example, we know that our phenotype, in particular cancer phenotype, can be related to, to the inheritance of a mutation in a gene that makes cell DNA repair less efficient. Uh, there are many different types of mutation involved in cancer diagnosis. And the concept that we're talking about here is one of what we call somatic mosaicism. Every, rather than thinking of our cells of our body as being totally the same, it's more productive, I think, for us to think of our cell, the cells of our body of being each different. So every cell of our body, even though they're very similar, have certain genetic differences between each other. Uh, and the, the take-home message from this from a cancer perspective is that all cancers result from somatic mutation events. Errors occur, errors accumulate, cancers can occur. There are other conditions that can occur from somatic mosaicism as well. Uh, generally, these can be predicted, they're called hamartoses, and these can be predicted as being asymmetric in a body uh, and have different images, and here is one right here. Sturgey weber syndrome is a condition of somatic mosaicism where early in embryogenesis, a delineation between right and left sides uh, uh, expresses itself as different uh, gene mutation. It can express not just on the surface, as you see in this child, but also internally uh, with brain malformations as well. So Sturgey Weber syndrome and many others can be described as somatic mosaic conditions. 
Another one is something called klippel trenani weber syndrome. This is a picture of a baby I delivered 10 years ago with that condition. Now, the last demonstration of non-Mendelian inheritance that we'll talk on briefly will be some having to do with an organelle, a small part of a cell called mitochondria. The, or, the mitochondria are cellular organelles which are important in uh, energy production in eukaryotic cells. All eukaryotic cells have, their, have mitochondria. And evolutionarily, we think that mitochondria results from a bacterial symbiosis where the bacteria was brought into the cell and provides a very useful function for the cell with energy metabolism. Each mitochondria itself, however, has its own DNA. And we think that there are anywhere from two to 10 chromosomes in each mitochondria. Each mitochondria chromosome has about 10 to 15,000 base pairs. Not a big number, but still, uh, still significant because there are 37 genes we know that are coded for by mitochondrial DNA. Now, if you have a mutation in a, in a gene of a mitochondria, your uh, expression would be particular to how that mitochondria can't work as well. And there are also other predictions too, and the predictions are here. Mitochondria, all of our mitochondria come from our mothers. The mother puts mitochondria into the egg, the sperm brings zero. So if a mother has a mitochondrial disease, every one of her children have a 100% chance of inheriting that mitochondrial disease from her mother. Fathers, as I mentioned, don't contribute mitochondria to their offspring. So this is a, what's known as a mitochondrial inheritance pattern. And it's unusual to predict it's um, uh, measurable. And there are a large number of mitochondrial diseases, diseases that have been characterized. Okay, so we've talked about Mendelian genetics. We've talked about non-Mendelian genetics. Let's, let's take the next step and talk about the newer technologies, in particular, next generation sequencing. Uh, it's pretty clear that the practice of medical genetics is dependent today, 2019, on taking advantage of the precision available with sequencing technologies. We have to figure in cost, the accuracy of the sequencing, what our clinical suspicions are and how we can uh, interpret results, and how we can alter management for patients where sequencing abnormalities can be picked up. Um, the claims that sequencing companies make, however, and reality can be very different. And I'll try to leave you with that at the end. Now, the reason we're having talks about DNA sequencing technologies is that sequencing has become much more available and much less expensive. If those of you who were around in the 90s remember the Human Genome Project, the initial human genome that was sequenced the estimate was that the cost of a whole genome sequence at that time was about 300 to 500 million dollars, million dollars. But the technologies have improved, and as of 2013, uh, the ability to, uh, to do a whole genome sequence fell below uh, $10,000, and I'm fully anticipating that within the next five, 10 years, we should be able to do uh, significant genome sequencing uh, for less than $1,000. It's, uh, it's a statement of technologic progress. I'm, I'm not anticipating the questions, well, I'm not looking forward to dealing with the questions that come out of this. Sequencing technologies have really advanced dramatically, and I'll try to show you that in just a minute. But there are things we need to think about every time we order and receive results from a DNA sequencing laboratory. There are four primary steps in DNA sequencing. First of all, we need to make sure that the DNA that we're going to be sequencing is prepared properly and that the, uh, that the preparation represents random fragmentation of the DNA that we'll be looking at. That is, the DNA we're looking at needs to represent uh, the whole genome or what it is that we're looking at in particular. And that has to be very, carefully assayed to make sure we're not getting um, 
a, a, a misrepresentation of what we're looking at. Then in order to look at the DNA itself, we need to make many, 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 many copies of the DNA that will be sequencing. That's called cluster generation. And we need to make sure that that cluster generation process is accurate without, uh, without errors. And then we get into the sequencing itself. The sequencing process is pretty well worked out and is very, very exciting. And uh, I'm just jazzed every time I uh, think about it, but it's, uh, it's a, a process that can be fraught with errors. And then at the very end, we need to think about how the data that we generate from the sequencing can be organized into an interpretable um, piece of data that, that will give us useful information. Being able to pull this together is not easy. Now I've got a copy of a uh, video. If you're interested in looking how, at how this is done, go to YouTube and put in the name Illumina. There are a number of different Illumina cartoons, one of which I'll show you right now, but there are many different ways of looking at this. And I think uh, we're gonna be showing a, a cartoon right now of how DNA sequencing is done. Sample preparation begins with extracted and purified DNA. The first step in Nextera sample preparation is tagmentation. During tagmentation, transposomes simultaneously fragment and tag the input DNA with adapters. Once the adapters have been ligated, reduced cycle amplification adds additional motifs, such as the sequencing primer binding sites, indices, and regions that are complementary to the flow cell oligos. This is the preparation part that has been Clustering is a process wherein each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, four fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determine the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index 1 read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the three prime end of the template is deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. 
Index 2 Read Product is washed off at the completion of this step. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo, forming a double-stranded bridge. This double-stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving the reverse strand. Read 2 begins with the introduction of the Read 2 sequencing primer. As with Read 1, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length is achieved. The Read 2 product is washed away. This entire process generates billions of reads, representing all the fragments. Sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the sample preparation. For each sample, reads with similar stretches of base calls are locally clustered. Forward and reverse reads are paired, creating contiguous sequences. These contiguous sequences are aligned back to the reference genome for variant identification. The paired end information is used to resolve ambiguous alignments. Um, I didn't show you that video to have you memorize how every step of this process is done. What I tried to do was indicate to you how complex the process is, number one. Number two, how beautiful the technology is. It's really remarkably uh, uh, intriguing that this degree of technology can be uh, utilized. And third, how important it is to be able to interpret the results that we can get in a critical way. Um, keeping up on these technologies can be hugely difficult. And unless you're able uh, to keep up on the technology, you're at risk of um, misinterpreting results. And what does that turn out to be? Well, when a DNA laboratory tech is waiting, or a rep is waiting in your waiting room, having brought lunch for everyone who works in your office, uh, that tech, that rep is not there because of your patients. That rep is there to sell product, to sell the technology. Um, you can order the technology, but unless you have the ability to critically know what that particular product that you'll be getting back is, it may be best to, uh, to reconsider. So what you end up getting then is a misrepresentation of a misunderstood technology to the misinformed. It is crucially important that the tests that are done and the interpretations that are performed are performed very, very carefully, and the oversight is limited. There is a company who has been marketing their technology uh, without ad addressing the issues having to do with a huge increase in false positivity. That's not right. So the question we get to is, where is the value of this testing, and why do sequencing companies exist? And the, the answer to the second question answers the first. The companies exist to make money. They exist to sell product. Their interest in your patients is tangential. It's crucial for us to remember that companies can misrepresent what it is that they do because we can't keep up with the technology. And what we end up getting then is this. This is an example of, I won't say the company, See if we can figure it out. So this is examples of the uh, the kinds of things you get online and you see ads for and how many different ways can we figure out what part of Europe your your family came from. Um, these kinds of technologies are huge, they're powerful, and they're very much misunderstood. So take everything that uh, we're dealing with here with a big grain of salt. So that pretty much finishes my presentation. I'd be very happy to uh, answer any questions if you have any. Uh, so this is uh, our first part in this four-part series on uh, genetics. 
So next time we'll have uh, Dr. Slotnick join us again to talk about uh, cancer as a genetic issue. Uh, then after that, we're going to be talking about neonatal and pediatric genetic screening, and then uh, wrap it up in July with whole genome sequencing. So hope to have you join us for at least a couple more of the sessions of this series, uh, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.